the attention of you know the meeting of Jordan, uh, who came and visited some of our participants, um, and now the government of Mexico is is uh, integrating uh, the concepts of contagious health. You know, this is what we call it, uh, contagious health into into some of their uh, national programs. Um, so th that's pretty much the end of this, the slides. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. You've been great. <laughs> What an impressive and interesting, you know, concept. I think a lot of us have thought about, you know, groups and um, group change. Although maybe, like you had mentioned, there's sometimes with random groups or random people. But leveraging the people you know to influence you and to, and and for you to influence them is, I think, pretty novel. Even though, like you said, it's it's something that's probably been in the back of our minds, un informally going on. And so unfortunately, um, Renee Santiago is not able to make it today from the county. And we won't ask random county people to speak yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so no pressure there. Yeah. But I think we could at least spend the next you know, 15 minutes or so discussing um, the impact of your conversation and maybe even hearing from you guys just first thoughts and hearing something like this and whether this is something that you know, the county could leverage in a way or um, is maybe already in place in some aspect and that we can all contribute. I think my question um, is, so it makes sense that if you're using existing familial groupings or clusters and looking at their social interaction and the impact, how do you think this would work if you took a group of patients in a clinic and created um, a cluster just out of that group of patients? Um, again, I think it's a it's a really interesting and important question. Um, I do think that there is value in in, in doing that. I mean, I, I think there's value in creating, um, you know, that uh, supportive dynamic, and especially because many people in different contexts may not be able to bring, you know, uh, two, three, four uh, family members. Um, uh, some of us here in this room probably don't, don't really have family who live in the Bay Area. You know, maybe they live there across the country. Um, so I, I do think that there's value, and, and I think it's a you know an interesting study for the future would be what is the relative advantage to, to kind of bring together a group of strangers versus bringing you know a, a mixed group or a group of family. Even. Um, but, but I do think that there's inherent power in the social dynamic, and especially if people can get to know one another through, um, through the, the, the program um, and become friendly with one another, uh, that may even have some psychological benefit beyond uh, you know, diabetes prevention or management. Um, if I think about our, our kind of work in Jordan, um, you know, we did, in, in certain circumstances, uh, create contexts which more people in the classroom didn't know each other um, than you know a bunch of kind of family and friends. But my preference, based on our experience, would be to have the ability to bring people that you know, um, coworkers or, or whatever it might be in a particular area. But I think there's inherent value in uh, if you've got a room of strangers, at least creating a curriculum that explicitly calls out and teaches people about the ways in which they're being influenced and the way they are influencing other people. And I think that is kind of a key differential here. Um, you know, uh, not to take for granted that, that people necessarily know that. I think many people, maybe in the back of their mind, they, they sort of understand, you know, that kids get each other to start smoking and you know they're aware of that sort of thing, but they're not really, fully aware of the ways in which other people influence them concerning these four key ends. I was going to say, one of the groups that made me think a lot about is the Visiana Compromise Home and the Supermatora Model, and yes. it's been around for decades, and uh, we've had a lot of work done in our, this community and across the Bay Area. With, with the model. Um, it's, it's a Promotora Model, so it's it's again, it's a great a Promotora Model. So health worker model. Okay. Um, it's from this music. Well, in the promotor model, it's a Latino community, and it's the same 
some of the same concepts, not necessarily the four amps, but some where you bring um, a group of um, people together, health workers together, train the health workers, and they go out and take the, you have some lead health workers, and they'll go out to the community and work within neighborhoods, find groups of people, do things in homes or kitchens, um, on driveways, and again, it just kind of um, ripples in terms of getting deeper into the community. So the, that whole network, and mm -hmm. I know that for, they've been looking at that um, reimbursement mechanism and including um, Healthcare workers and through healthcare plans, to, just like you're saying, to, because they can oftentimes be the most powerful people and have the time and ability to have those conversations where the physicians don't. And so I think that concept is there, and, um, and maybe there's some mechanisms there to think about scaling it. Um, but sometimes if it's, if it's not in the Latino community, then let's say health workers versus a from a daughter. I think it's something similar to, um, I'm not sure if it's actually similar, maybe it's a little bit different. You know, we, Blue Shield works with uh, Stanford. There's a doctor there, Dr. <laughs> Kate Lorig. She does this chronic disease management program. Uh -huh. um, and we actually partner with her, so we offer that too for our members. Um, so when they do attend the program, it's also saying you just, you get, well, you get strangers coming together yeah. to talk about chronic disease, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, or whatever it may be. And um, I, I'm not sure if they have that, the influence part. I think they talk about the disease part and what they need to do. Yeah. I'm not sure if they actually, you know, get into and delve into the um, how do we social part of it. You know, how to how to or that explicit statement about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Spreading. I, I don't think that's part of it. Yeah, I don't think it's part of that program. So, so one of the things we are talking about at the county level is well, you're right. We we talk about the the disease model and right. we talk about you know the um, clinic interventions. One of the things that we don't talk a lot about uh, is the behavioral aspect of disease progression. Mm -hmm. And so we need to bring that conversation um, into our clinical uh, protocols and into our public health models. So we're looking at partnering with uh, county behavioral health to start that conversation so that we're not so disjointed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. It's okay. It's a big idea. I didn't think about how we influence each other. I think it was sort of implicit. Like I kind of knew that, but I didn't actually know it until you said it out loud and what that looks like. And it's actually really real. You know, we do influence each other. Some of that's in youth tobacco prevention. They really play on some of those who, who influences you and how you influence others. But it's not universally. It's not a thread through that. So yeah. there's a lot of areas that you see that this could be used, but it would, it's not necessarily. One of the advantages of working in a very traditional setting in Jordan is um, oftentimes uh, uh, mostly women who come to the program are wearing, um, uh, they're dressed very, very similar. Um, so, so they'll be wearing sort of, sort of like a black uh, uh, robe and, and you know, a, a head covering. And so uh, there's an instance where somebody was challenging the, the facilitator and saying, you know, I don't let other people influence me, and you know, you know, hey, this concept, I don't quite like it. And so the facilitator said, "Well, look around the room. How come everybody's dressed the same way, <laughs> right? If, if you're not influencing one another, um, and you know, you can do this in so many ways. Like, uh, let's let's do a survey of the room. You know, what what's what's for dinner tonight? And you know, the, there's pretty much you know five staple dishes. <laughs> and they're all cooking the same sorts of food." Um, so, you know, my question for, for some of you, if, if I may uh, put this on the table, is, you know, I started off by saying that there's this new research out in the UK, which is, it's not a, a dietary intervention in the sense that we're talking about it. You know, it's a very extreme version, you know, uh, calorie restriction for uh, 800 calories a day, uh, you know, somebody's doing that, they're going to need a lot of social support. And so, you know, some of the things we've been thinking about is how can we um, apply some, some of the social support models to, to actually doing that and carrying it out so potentially one might put diabetes in remission. Because uh, that's what that's what this study by Roy Taylor seems to suggest, is that um, following this protocol, not in every case, but in, in most cases, can actually essentially cure the type 2 diabetes. So. My question for maybe some of the plans and providers here today is, I mean, it, is that something 
you folks are really thinking about. I mean, if I told you 10 years ago that you could uh, heal a diabetic patient, I mean, and, and by the way, this doesn't even get to the positive effects that that sort of uh, intervention might have on cardiovascular health, uh, health you know, uh, bringing down blood pressure levels and <coughs> cholesterol. So I mean, is that really of interest? Yes, actually, we, um, we already do that. We are working with Dr. Ornish uh -huh. out of UCLA, and you know, he has, Dr. Dean Ornish, um, so he has a program where he says he can reverse diabetes and heart disease, and it's like a nine-week program. So we actually offer that to our members. Um, we don't get a lot of uptick. It's there. It's available. Uh, you have to qualify for it. If you have known diabetes, hypertension, I mean, coronary artery disease, there's some, uh, he has some uh, guidelines. And, and what and what do you offer? Do you offer it's, enrollment? It's, in the we, we offer enrollment in the program. It's, I think, a nine-week program that he has. Uh -huh. And he includes, uh, which includes, um, I think it's uh, stress reduction, social socialization, like the group yeah. therapy. Um, yoga, I think, is meal planning. And it's a very strict meal yeah. planning, yeah. Yeah. which is uh, plant-based. Yeah. It's all, it, I think it's completely plant-based. Yeah. And um, it, he has shown in his studies, with randomized control studies, that he has reversed diabetes and coronary artery disease in one new program. He's so been out a long time. small and he's been around. You can research him. You can research him. He's been out a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, we, are, we do offer that. As a plan, we do offer that to our Bill, Bill Clinton went on this. Uh, yes, yeah. you know, the plant-based diet. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but we yeah. don't have a lot of enrollees. I mean, we offer it, but. You don't have a lot of love to. Yeah. So it's okay. interesting because it's a very expensive program otherwise. It, it is very right. expensive. People probably don't realize. I, my dad has no known coronary artery disease. I can't get him to enrol. Yeah. <laughs> and I tried. I'm like, you go Blue Shield. Yeah. I can Use get it. you in. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. Next. Have you found like a minimum of sessions that people need to do of your program? Is it does it stuck in their way? You said there was a shorter one that yeah. was eight weeks or we we um we used a, a an eight week session and the way we were thinking about it is can we create, you know, eight slide decks apparently, you know. Just, just so you can picture it, um, you know, with kind of cartoon figures and kind of make it fun, that you know people could essentially take this home and teach it to their family. Mm -hmm. So we did eight of these sessions, um, and you know people loved it. This was really what the UN had used. Um, we didn't test it in the randomized control trial context. Um, we did do sort of a study with the UN on it and. Uh, should benefit. You know, my, my feeling is that the uh, randomized trial here, you know, that was longer and more intense, and there was more kind of uh, activities that went into it, uh, you know, cooking classes, common exercise classes, you know, things like that. That uh, had a bigger, you know, impact on, on the participants. Um, and, and, and they really, they really loved it. And do you feel like it has to be a program that is um, followed up every week to create a momentum and like a minimum, like so that because if you have it once a month, yeah, it might dilute the effect. Yes. So does it need to be weekly for? Yeah, I mean it kind of goes goes back to this uh, question of the diet, right? Uh, right. The, the, the the idea of doing an intense, you know, almost starvation diet, you know, in order to kind of kick things into gear. Um, I, I do think there's benefit in kind of an early on kind of concentration mm -hmm. and uh, you know really getting people enthusiastic. Don't let the enthusiasm wane. You know, mm -hmm. just don't let other things happen in life. Uh, get people while they're committed um, and, and kind of compacting as much as possible without disrupting their schedule. Uh, and once they improve their their sense of security or how they feel about their health, is that when you see them switch? You, you have like a graph there of how they felt about the Oh, yes. There. Um, what was that called? Any gain of confidence? Yes. So, um, I would say that, you know, if I were to kind of 
think about like the journey of an individual and, and their process. Um, you know, for, for losing weight, for example, reducing their blood pressure. I would say that that the key the key thing is when that light bulb goes off and they kind of realize that they can actually do something to improve the way that they're feeling. And um, you, in a sense, you could say that, well, that's, that's self-confidence. Um, but it's also about kind of, you know, what we were talking about earlier, where one has to sort of like formally make a commitment, even if it's just themselves, that they're kind of writing down, OK, I want to I wanna set a goal. And, and I want to kind of work towards that goal. Uh, you know, in a sense, creating a, a, a sense of purpose to the program. A, a, a sense of personal uh, purpose for their for their health profile and for their family. Yes. So you know, this is a really challenging issue because uh, you know NIH has funded studies on the relationship between the weight loss and and blood um, uh, glucose control. Yes. For about forty years, and so they they will go through essentially forty years of small trials showing that losing weight. Uh, is helpful in controlling blood sugar. And, and I think that's very well established. I think that where you're getting to is something that's much more important, which is over the course of those four years, there have actually been very few trials that have showed that you can get people to sustain the combination of, of reduced weight and reduced blood sugar. And that the more aggressive approach, you know, this, this approach of uh, very severe calorie restriction may, may produce some harm. The reason for that is that when people lose weight and then they regain it, and they have these repeated cycles of, of weight loss and weight gain, they're both human and animal studies, uh, models that show that in fact you know, you create a, a, a different metabolic situation that, that <coughs> can be harmful. So the, you know, the follow-up to DPP, the big NIH trial uh, called Look Ahead, um, actually did not show a benefit in terms of, of long-term uh, outcome. And presumably that's because of the inability to sustain the weight loss over the course of time. And so it, it seems to me that what you really have that, that's very attractive is just an alternative way of, of doing this that might build us into communities and families and so forth that, that allows this to be sustained over the course of time. Oh, that's that's very interesting, and and I think um, I think your point about kind of gaining it back is really important because you mentioned the you know the physical aspects, uh, the toll it takes on your body, but there's also kind of a, a psychological aspect. Like right? people become really discouraged, and it's kind of like you know somebody gave you hope, and then you know. You weren't able to do it, and you get knocked down again, um, and so you're even more discouraged than, than you were at the beginning. Um, you know that's why, as I think about some of these diets, specifically the one I mentioned by Roy Taylor, I think there are two interesting things to, to think about. The first is that um, it's not just kind of the standard um, obesity question that that is trial addresses, it's that it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's weight that is specifically tailored to the individual. So what works for person one may not actually be OK for person two, even if, even if they, you know, they don't, uh, uh, you know, on observation, uh, look a certain way. Or, um, and, and so his, his kind of pinpointing the, the liver and the pancreas as the places where you've got to kind of burn out, <laughs> burn out the fat, um, seems to be really interesting. And, and if we could sort of combine some kind of severe intervention like that with some kind of a, uh, a safety net that will catch people and prevent them from kind of you know, regaining that weight so that they don't do more harm to themselves uh, physiologically but also psychologically, um, you know, I, I think that would be a really